Our gracious and eternal God, as we come before you again this morning, we look up to you as our Father in heaven. We, your children, hungry to be fed by you, fed of the bread of life. And we pray that you would take your scriptures by your spirit, that you would break them us, that you would place them as it were before us and that you would be gracious to us and that you would feed our souls. We pray for more than just knowledge to come into our minds. We pray above all that your truth taken by your spirit would ignite within our hearts a fresh love and a for our Lord and a keenness and a zeal to serve you with new vigour. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever experienced heart burn? You know that burning sensation in the chest? I'm sure most of us have had that, that sensation. Perhaps you, you ate too much. That sense of burning started behind your, your sternum and it, and it rose up, as it were, to, towards your throat. We're told that one in five Australians experience that sensation of heartburn uh, once a week. It's, it's not a rare thing. Not necessarily at all a, a pleasant experience. Uh, it, it perhaps could seem harmless. Some would suggest medically that it could even be some indicator of a f- physical problem that's underlying uh, that symptom. Well, this morning, friends, we're considering heartburn, but not physical heartburn. This is not some medical lesson. But we're considering what I'm calling spiritual heartburn. Physical heartburn may not be a good and a pleasant thing. But I want to suggest to you right at the outset that spiritual heartburn is a wonderful and a good thing. You see, without burning hearts, we will be dull as Christians. Physical heartburn, that physical experience, isn't something that may be desirable. But I suggest to you as Christians, spiritual heartburn is something that we should all desire. We've just had read to us this passage in Luke chapter 24. this story, we see two men who I think experienced spiritual heartburn. They had experienced in their own circumstance, here in the story that we read, they'd experienced some major setback. They had had what was really a profound disappointment in their experience. And out of that grew their hearts that quickly became dull and flat. And yet when they came into Christ's near presence, their hearts are set on fire. You see, we first see them in this story with dull hearts. By the time we leave them at the end of the passage, we see them with hearts all ablaze. These two disciples, only one of which is named, These two disciples, I believe, have much to teach us today. Many lessons that we can draw from this story. Much that we can them about spiritual heartburn. They reveal to us, surely at the start of the passage, what we ourselves can often experience. And that is as believers having dull hearts spiritually. They show us at the end of the passage if he would come to us as he came to them that we could be believers with spiritual heartburn hearts as it were that are on fire for our Lord so I want to ask that you would come with me as we go back to Luke chapter 24 and and if you like come with me on, on this walk with these men as we walk with them down the road to Emmaus and it's through the pen of Luke, that it's like we can peer over their shoulders, we can watch these two, we can listen to what they say in their conversation, and I think we can learn from these two as well. As we travel down this dusty old road heading away from Jerusalem towards this town of Emmaus, we see firstly through Luke's pen the dull heart described. The dull heart described 
described. That's the first of two things that we will think about. You see, the condition of the heart disciples is described for us, it's summarized for us in the words of Jesus in verse 25. Luke 24, verse 25. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all prophets have spoken. Here Jesus describes these disciples, these two men. And one of the ways he describes them is he says in the translation, at least in the New King James from the Greek original, is that you are slow of heart. You are slow of heart. Now that could be translated, you are sluggish of heart. You are dull of heart. And that's Jesus' assessment. That's Jesus' summary. That's Jesus' description of these men. Now, do you think what Jesus says is true? <laughs> well, of course it's true. Whatever they are, as we peer over their shoulders that, that, that this is really what they are like, well, let's, let's see the description that Luke gives in the previous two verses uh, back up on the passage in verses 15 and 16. But he actually describes their walk. He describes what they are like. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Here they are walking on the road. And as they're walking along this road, Jesus Christ comes into their presence. But they did not sense that it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Their hearts were so dull that they didn't even realize that Christ had drew near to them. There is often, is there not, this connection between the state, the spiritual condition of our hearts and can and cannot see or perceive? Well, I believe we have that here. And according to their own testimony, it seems that previously they had been exposed to Christ We look at verse 19, in their own words they speak about what they have known of this Jesus of Nazareth, they said, the prophet, mighty, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Though these two disciples are not part of the inner twelve, they're part of the wider circle of Jesus' followers. And, and, And they have been with Christ, they have been where Christ was before, previously. In former days, evidently, they had seen Christ do many mighty things. These men, along with all the people, had sat under the mighty preaching ministry of the Lord Jesus. But now, with their hearts so dull as they were, they were spiritually unperceptive. They were sluggish and dull, and all that was uh, uh, they had experienced before was simply that. It was a past, distant, pleasant memory of a former experience. That same Christ whom they had experienced before, that same one who stirred their hearts perhaps, now that same Christ is with them. He's in their presence, but in their dullness, they did not realize, they did not perceive that they were with Christ. Christian friends, how many times have I gone to our Bibles? How many times have you and I gone to the place of prayer privately? And we have gone with dull hearts. And in that place, Christ was truly present. But due to our sluggish hearts, our sluggish conditions, we didn't even realize that we were in his presence. Perhaps we went to pray with others. We gathered even in this place to worship him. And yet with a dull heart, and when we we, we came and we went, we rose, we went our way with the same cool hearts, and we had experienced nothing of the warmth and the quickening of Christ's near presence. Perhaps many of us could quickly say, we, we can look back over our own Christian experience, And we can recall those times when our hearts were stirred within us. When we entered fully into Christ's presence and there was that sense of delight and and, and joy in his presence. That we had a deep affection for our Lord previously. But now with such dull hearts, that's sort of like a distant memory 
If I'm describing you, well, I'm describing all Christians. Because all Christians, all believers struggle with this from time to time. Even the the most godliest of saints have struggled with this. I believe this is the very thing that William Cowper was describing that man who had such a tender heart toward the Lord in his hymn. You remember those words? Is the blessedness I knew when I first saw the Lord? Where is the soul refreshing view of Jesus and his word? What I had before, I don't have now. What peaceful hours I once enjoyed. How sweet their memory still. But they have left an aid the world can never fill. This is a struggle, an experience. This is the reality of what all Christians go through from time to time. So what we analyse as we look over the shoulders of these two is not some rare thing that's a one-off event in history. This is our struggle as Christians. As we again glance back over the shoulders of these two, we notice something else about their sluggish state it's described by Jesus earlier in the passage not just verse 25 but if you go back to verse 17 listen to what Jesus says as he comes to them he says to them what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad you know, they're right at the end of verse 17. Jesus is, is, as it were, describing their physical condition. He's describing their conduct. He's even describing their countenance. He says two things. He says, as you walk and are sad. Now, some translations actually take the word walk there and they say, well, it could also, maybe even it's saying they stood still. Perhaps these men, so sluggish in their hearts, it's affected their physical activity. It's affected how they walked on the road. They're dragging their feet as they go along from Jerusalem, heading back to Emmaus, and they're walking slower and slower, and maybe they even come to a halt. You see, the progress on the road is very slow, with dull hearts. Their hearts were sluggish, and their steps were sluggish but Jesus also says there at the end of verse 17 uh, it's like we can peer looking over their shoulders as Jesus describes and we can see their county say what's the look on their face you are sad Jesus says here they are with this depressed this sullen this somber appearance on their face you see What our countenance often does, it's like a mirror to our hearts. Our countenance, the look on our, reveals what's in our hearts. Jesus says these men are sad. There's this appearance of sadness. You know that word sad is the very same word Jesus uses back in Matthew 6 and verse 16. And it's helpful because there in 6, Jesus is talking about fasting and he's talking about the, the hypocrites who are fasting. Remember what Jesus says about their faces. He says they have gloomy faces. It's the same word that Jesus uses here to describe these two. Such a look on their face is obvious to those around. Other people can this dullness of heart because it shows itself outwardly on the countenance. Now, obviously, the countenance could be fake. We can put on one of those surreal smiles. Everybody knows it's not real. But overall, countenance reflects what's in our hearts. And others notice. Jesus noticed. We can peer over these two, over their shoulders, and we can notice. And people can look at our faces, other Christians discerning, and they can know more than just your face. It reveals the heart. You see, the point is that we see here that the progress along the road of these two was slow. The things became gloomy for them. They had forgotten what it was to be joyful as disciples of Jesus. In many respects, we could say that their, their, their walk was a stagnant and a gloomy walk. And friends, every time we have dull hearts for the Lord, that, that's our walk. Our walk with Christ is stagnant and gloomy. 
our cold hearts can send a chill others. The joy of the Lord that should be present is replaced with the gloom and a flatness spiritually. And such a negative spirit most often will affect, have an effect upon others. Others notice not only our face, but they will notice even our... That is a reflection of our hearts. Well, as we think about their walk along this road, we can't help think about the direction they are going. We're told where they are headed back in verse 13 at the very commencement of this little tale. It says, Now behold, two of them travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. They're travelling away from Jerusalem to this village called Emmaus. It, it could have been their hometown, but we can't exactly be sure. But the point is, away from Jerusalem and they're going to Emmaus. Now what was in Jerusalem? What, what had they left behind in Jerusalem? Well, there's probably many answers to that, but obviously the main thing that's in Jerusalem is the temple. That is the house of prayer, as the Bible describes it, the place of worship. It was in Jerusalem, it was also the place where they publicly gathered with God's people to worship him and to pray to him. And they did that not just privately, but they did that together. And yet we also know that it was in Jerusalem where these men had previously enjoyed fellowship with other disciples. But now, in their state of spiritual dullness, they're not motivated for those things so much anymore. They drudge on their way towards Emmaus. Don't things, things often go together, friends? When our hearts are dull spiritually, fellowship with other Christians doesn't seem to rate very high anymore. The very thing we need at that point is often the very thing we don't. What we need most, we want least. Gathering with God's people in worship, staying to pray together doesn't seem that attractive or doesn't seem that important. A lack of spiritual desires, there may be circles that stops, but ultimately we're speaking of the heart here. A lack of spiritual desires for such public and private means of grace, that reveals a heart that is spiritually dull. Physical heartburn may, may reveal some underlying physical problems. But with the inner man, when our hearts are dull spiritually, it most often is revealing some underlying spiritual problem. Well, as we then are considering really the, the dullness here of these two travellers, what can we see led to them being this way? I've hinted at something already, but what else is there in this passage? What else is there in the context of this story that helps us and what leads to this dullness? Well, when Jesus spoke of the problem in their hearts in verse 25, he actually, actually connected a couple of things together. Look back at verse 25 and see what Jesus says, because I only sort of was quoting before part of the verse. Verse 25, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, not full stop, slow of heart to believe. Jesus tells them that they had been lacking faith. Now, this connection between unbelief and sluggishness of heart, I think, comes out in their own words. We analyse their own words a little closer. As they say in verse 19, listen to what they say. The, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God. But he is a prophet. He was a prophet, implying that he is no longer a prophet, implying that he is no longer with us, implying that he has gone. It's a thing of the past. He was a prophet. 
And then as they go on to say in verse 21, we were hoping that it was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. It's the third day since he was put to death and crucified, which they mention in verse 20. The third day. So what happens by the time it's the third day since you've been dead? It's too late now. His body is too far decayed now. It's the third day. And then they say in verse 22, Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early, they astonished. We, we were all startled with what the women said. Why so startled? Because we don't believe it. Jesus highlights something of the root of such dull hearts toward him and that is a spirit of doubt, a lack of faith. You see, when we doubt what Christ says, it leaves us in a state without hope. Our hearts will be sluggish as well. Now, Jesus had clearly said, had he not, throughout his earthly ministry, clearly said that on the third day he would rise from the dead. Their expectation of Christ's presence now, though it's completely gone. Why? Because they lacked faith in what he clearly had said. Doubt has clouded their eyes. Previously, perhaps, they began to love this Christ. They saw what he did, they listened to what he said, and they began to trust, it seemed, in this Christ. But when doubts arose, whatever heat of affection and hope they had, it was like it sent an Antarctic blast through their soul. Once there was heat, now they're cold. Friends, our lack of faith in Christ, our doubting his word and his ability to work in our lives will send a chill into our own hearts. You know, I think there's also something else here by way of a root of this dull-heartedness, not just doubt, but I think we can also see disappointment. Isn't that what they're speaking about, in part at least, in verse 21? Disappointment. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. There's a deep and a profound sense of disappointment of what has unfolded. These men were obviously closely associated with the 11 disciples and these women who they're part of that company. And so the events of the last three or four, four days must have been very traumatic for them. We were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. That's what our group was hoping. What their group ended up being was not what they thought it was going to be. And they're so discouraged. Some, you know the Gospels, some, he left them. Jesus was now gone and they too were on their way home. They had left the other disciples behind. Perhaps they felt some sense of bitterness toward the religious leaders in the unjust way that they treated Jesus. Do you know that because of how they express what happened in verse 20? where they says how the chief priests and not the rulers, the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Some of their own whom they associated with, who once it seems they had an esteem for, had turned against them, our own rulers. And certainly from those words in verse 21, we can hear their disappointment, can't we? Oh, we hoped. We were hoping. We were hoping. Now things had not worked out as they hoped. Their hopes were dashed. We see that their disappointment, though, when we analyse it, 
was based upon them observing things external. They were not actually seeing what God was truly doing in his sovereignty. We were hoping for redemption. But our hopes are now dashed. We were hoping that this Christ would redeem Israel, but now this Christ has died. You see, they were looking at the externals and they completely missed the reality of what God was actually doing in his sovereignty. Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And it seems through this whole situation, it allowed their hearts to be affected. Rather, As Proverbs 4 says, rather than keeping their hearts with all diligence, they allow them to grow cool and become dull. Their former spiritual sharpness was blunted by this deep disappointment. Friends, cannot that be us as well? Perhaps you get discouraged. As things have not worked out in your situation as you hoped. Perhaps you desired to see family blessings, but you're disappointed. The things have not happened as you expected. Or maybe on another level, for, for months you have taught Shadari class. For you have been planting seeds with that neighbour. You've been giving out tracts. You've been witnessing at work. You've been praying for your family to be saved. But it all seems like nothing's happened. Maybe you've hoped through the ministry of this church, through the pulpit ministry, through the other outreaches, that, that many more would be saved. But you're disappointed. You see, all the while, We too can just be looking at externals and not actually realise, actually perceive what God in his sovereignty has actually been doing behind the scenes the whole time in the midst of what we see are disappointments. Sinners have been saved. Lives are being changed marriages are being transformed Christians are growing in grace and knowledge of the truth yet we look at the external and we have a pre expectation or hope and it doesn't get met and we're disappointed Perhaps there's personal pain in the way someone's been treated, the way that you have been treated. Maybe there's even a sense like these, a a sense of hurt, a sense of disappointment, a sense of personal bitterness. Their tendency is our natural tendency and that is to withdraw into ourselves in those situations And then when we withdraw into ourselves, that's when we become even more discouraged. Just like these two, the danger is, unless we keep our hearts with all diligence, our hearts, our hearts, can cool and become dull due to a sob deep disappointment. And like these two, our hopes are dashed. And you know the Lord Jesus does not want us to stay in that state. That, that's why this passage doesn't, doesn't end <laughs> like where we are right now. Because it goes on, the story goes on and it speaks about the, the glorious thing that unfolded. That's the second thing we come to now, what I'm calling the disciples' heart revived. Yes, we've seen the dull heart described, but now notice with me, the disciples' heart revived. And as they continue down the road to Emmaus, from verse 28, they drew near to the village where they were going, and he, Jesus, indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening.' 
and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them and he took bread, blessed and broke it and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while we, he talked with us on the road and while he the scriptures to us? Here Luke is showing to us something that that initially we wouldn't be able to see, but Luke by the Spirit shows us what's happening in their hearts. The Lord set their hearts on fire. Did not our hearts burn within us? See, now we get to spiritual heartburn, and this is a good thing. What was it that put their hearts on fire? There are two things that they mention in verse 32, and this is really the key, I think, to the passage. Two things. Did not our heart burn within us, walk with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? Two things there. Firstly, communion with the person of Christ. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us? Here it is, that their dull hearts were in in the context of personal communion with Christ. Now surely, Christian, you have proven that, haven't you? You begun praying cool in heart, attended worship with dullness, and yet in that place of prayer, yet when you were reading your Bible, gathering here to worship in Christ's presence, you were communing with Christ and you too had your heart inflamed afresh in that very context. Out on the road, these two disciples discovered this important lesson for their experience and our Christian experience. We are out Christ for heart to heart communion. It's the place. The heart is revived. When the Christian then leaves off meeting with Christ in the private place, when the Christian leaves off meeting Christ in the public place, we should not be surprised that they too become spiritually sluggish and discouraged. It's in that situation that doubts arise and that's often when criticisms flow. What does God say? Draw near to God and he will draw near to to you. Don't just go through the motions, which is easy to do when it is part of our regular routine as it ought to be part of our regular routine to daily read our Bibles, to seek God in prayer, to meet with God speakly if that is an enabling thing that we can do by God's grace. But not just going through the motions. Drawing near to God. Deliberately consciously drawing near to him seeking out Christ in heart to heart communication that's where the heart is revived did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road communion with the person of Christ the second thing we see here is reception of the word of Christ did not our hearts burn within us while he opened the scriptures to us. Verse 27 gives us the fuller description of what that was. Verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. There's our Lord expounding to them Old Testament Bible. From Genesis to Malachi, all of it ultimately has this dominating theme that it's pointing to Jesus Christ. So Jesus opened the first part of the Bible as he refers to there, Luke says, from Moses. Jesus opened Genesis, as it were, to show them himself. It's like he opened up the door. Let me open up the door. Let me introduce you to this one. He opened up of Genesis Here is Jesus. He opened up the door of Exodus. Here is Jesus. He opened up the the door of Leviticus. 
Here is Jesus. In all the scriptures, he says, he showed them the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God was expounded. It was explained. And it's primarily on himself, on Christ. Now notice, friends, it was not the performance of a miracle on the road that inflamed their hearts. But it was the simple, plain and clear exposition of Holy We shouldn't miss that. We know that many are chasing the excitement of a performance today. Some are seeking a moving emotional experience through music or the like. But that's not what Jesus did with these two. Plain, clear explanation and application of God's word. It's one of God's ordained means to feed our souls and to inflame our hearts. This is what brings on spiritual heartburn. Hearts will not be inflamed spiritually by the buzz of a performance. There may be a moving of the heart, but I'm saying spiritual stirring. A spiritual, not a carnal but a spiritual heartburn will not happen by the buzz of performance or by a twang of a guitar. It is when the word of Christ faithfully proclaimed and obeyed, that's when hearts are truly revived. Here is the antidote to our dull hearts, friends. Here is the antidote to a dull pulpit, to dull pews. There is nothing more enlivening than Christ-centered preaching of all of the Bible and personal communion directed Christ. And so when the heart is set on fire by Christ and for Christ, there are consequences, there are evidences, it will show itself like a dull heart shows itself, a spiritually stirred heart, a spiritual heartburn shows itself. How does it show these two? Well, look down at verse 28. And they drew near to the village when they were going and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. You notice with burning, they now wanted more of Christ. It says there that they constrained him. That's strong language. That's the idea of to compel with force. They wanted Christ. It was Christ. Christ. With these burning hearts, they didn't want to have ended what they had been experiencing. They wanted more and more of him. He must stay with us. They wanted more of his presence. They wanted more of the exposition of his word of him. They wanted more personal communion with him. And then, that's why they say in verse 29, the, and the, the force of this perhaps misses us a little bit when he says, abide with us. That's not a simple question, request, or some sort of suggestion. That is actually a command original. There was a deep sense of urgency and earnestness. They were so determined that they would, would take no, would not take a no for an answer. Their hearts were so burning within them that they must have more of Christ, more of his word, more of his fellowship. Friends, there's a sign of a burning heart. Can't get enough of communion with Christ. Can't get enough of the reception of of his word and likewise that is a sign of a cool heart counting the minutes of how long the sermon goes pursuing a shorter reading rather than a long one burning hearts can't get enough of the word of Christ can't get enough of the presence of Christ You know, if anyone happened to be out there on that road, saw those two earlier in the day, and then saw these same two later that same day, one wonders whether they probably didn't recognize them as the same men. 
A few before, they, they walked that same road. Remember their description that we saw there in Luke, that they were gloomy, they were dragging their feet. They're on their way, away from Jerusalem. They're heading out to Emmaus. And then God comes to them by His Spirit through Christ. And then when they are on their way back, as we'll get to in a moment, one wonders whether the pace was increased. That they're not dragging their feet anymore, that they're almost skipping and beginning to run on their way back. And there's not gloominess on their face. Their hearts have changed and so is their countenance. They're beaming with a sense of expectancy and delight and joy at to Jerusalem. The thing that's changed is not the feet and not the mouth. It's not the face. The thing that has changed is the heart. Morris Roberts says... There is not a church in the world that does not need to see more shining faces than they see at present. Greatest need we all have is for more of the burning heart, he says. It cannot be concealed. When it exists, it will show itself in unctuous prayers, in heavenly talk, in holy living, in fervent affection, in patient suffering, and in ardent hope for God's blessing. It cannot conceal itself we see finally as we close how a burning heart is so enthusiastic for the things of Christ look at verse 33 and so these burning hearts Jesus has just vanished from their sight and their hearts are burning they're pondering what's just happened they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together With a burning heart, there within them, there is no obstacle to, there is nothing that is too inconvenient for them. Whatever it is, it melts away with these burning hearts. There's a saying, isn't there? Where there's a will, there's a way. Well, in light of this passage, could not we change that? Where there is a burning heart, there is a way. That very hour, they got up and they returned back to Jerusalem. You say, but hang on a bit. Aren't they in the middle of their meal? What about the distance of seven miles? What about the danger? What about the darkness? It's darkness now. I mean, isn't it time to settle in for the night? I mean, can't I wait till tomorrow? I mean, is it a time when you put your feet up and relax? I mean, aren't they tired over these last few days of emotional exhaustion and physical exhaustion? It's a little fanatical, isn't it? A bit extreme over the top. Luke records what happened. What does he say? Their hearts burned within them. Then verse 33, So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. Friends, when God truly moves in the heart of ordinary people, these are the things that happen. It may seem strange to the world. It may seem extreme to nominal Christians. But when Christ moves in his people, they are zealous for spiritual things. It's most clearly illustrated in days of revival. Because in days of revival, when God comes and he sets hearts ablaze, it is not uncommon for people to happily walk hours through wintry snow just to go and to meet with God's people. Those sort of things are not hindrances. Those sort of things are not inconvenient or obstacles for people not to go. With burning hearts, there is such a hunger and such a desire and such a a zeal. Luke says, with burning hearts, so rose up that very hour and went to Jerusalem. In October 1940, in Madras, as it was called then, now Shenai, God set ablaze many hearts. It was the monsoon season, and I quote, As were dark and threatening, and we thought it would be unnecessary to go inside. But a very large crowd had gathered, far more than the church could accommodate. After prayer, Brother Singh decided we should carry on in the open. And suddenly, it began to rain very heavily. 
He urged the people not to stir, but just to protect their Bibles by putting them under their clothes. And he continued to preach. The people just sat on the ground in the pouring rain with rivulets of water running beneath them. They soaked to the skin, went on listening to God's saving word. And only after a long time, there were mothers with babies in their arms. And yet no one stirred until the meeting was over and no one was anxious for it to conclude early. For a wind of God was blowing through Madras and the showers that watered our hearts were showers of blessing. One example, just one, of hearts that are burning for God. There are no obstacles and inconveniences. With spiritual heartburn in these men, what were they zealous to do? Very briefly, look back at the passage. In verse 33, we're told they went not just to Jerusalem out there general. No. Why did they go to Jerusalem? Because they went to find the eleven and those who were with them. With hearts burning when they find them, what did they do? Well, they had to speak. They had to share. What's it say in verse 34? Saying to them, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them, king of bread. With hearts ablaze, they returned back to the place of fellowship. They returned to the corporate gathering of God's people. They were not content to stay at home and feel sorry for themselves. You notice the theme of their speech? It was not the weather. It was not the recent political developments in Jerusalem. It was not of the state of the road out on Emmaus and how the local council had not filled in the holes. They spoke about Christ. Their hearts were by Christ and for Christ. And can I say by way of illustration that this was one of the things actually that encouraged me last week with our visit last Lord's Day in Sydney. And that was the spiritual conversations after the services in both churches that we visited. Hearts inflamed on the things of God and they wanted to speak on spiritual things. Here's a word of encouragement, friends, for us today over our cuppa and over lunch. Encourage one another by speaking on Christ. Share about spirit things. Not just the weather or recent political events, though that may be the first thing that would want to normally pop into your mind. That will not edify. Christ edifies. Politics certainly does not edify. What Christ can do, not what Campbell or Cater can do. Wonderful example here in the word of God of when the heart is stirred, how we want to share about spiritual things. We see then that when God ignites our hearts afresh, giving this blessed experience of spiritual heartburn, it's then that we are freshly hungry for the word of God and our desire for communion with Christ increases. We're keen again to meet with God's people to encourage them and to fellowship on the things of Christ. And like these men, we want to tell others about the resurrected Christ. We're zealous to tell them about not just doctrine of Christ, but about what this Christ is to me personally. That's what they were sharing. Zealous to pray together with the Son. Zealous to worship with his people. Well then, as we come to a conclusion this morning, let me ask the obvious. What is the spiritual state of your heart today? That's not a question of what was it 12 months ago, two years ago, 15 years ago, or even last week. What is the spiritual state of your heart today? Is it cool and sluggish? dull as a Christian or 
Are you experiencing spiritual heartburn? What's your answer? You say, well, I really think I'm dull and sluggish with you. How will you experience then spiritual heartburn again? Well, it's not by giddiness. It's not by getting busy. We've seen it this morning in this. It's by us as we've been peering over the shoulders of these two. What have we seen? It's communion with Christ. Personal communion with Christ. Mum can't do that for you. Dad can't do that for you. Your wife or husband can't do that for you. I can't do that for you. It's personal communion with Christ. And it is the word of God. It is the explanation of his word, privately and publicly. The simple, tried and proven ways of Christ These alone will the issues of the human heart, friends. These are the things that God uses, that his spirit takes. These have always been the things that he uses. May God give us a fresh vision and commitment to the simple ways of Christ in his church, that we may all have hearts that with him, that we may have spiritual heartburn, which is a good thing. Not physical heartburn, which could reveal some underlying serious problems, but rather a spiritual heartburn that shows that God alone has been at work in our hearts. Let's close in a word of prayer.